everybody to another episode of Ask Wholesale Live. I'm your producer, Kirk Barbera, and we got Marco and a special guest all the way from Los Angeles, Rob Flitton. Now, Rob is an acquisition specialist out of LA, and he focuses on multifamily and mixed use development. He's an, again, an acquisition specialist. But most importantly, for the purposes of Ask Wholesale and wholesalers, he is a master negotiator. And you know, we, Marco and the team at Hilco Homes has talked a lot about negotiation. And uh, Rob is, has a forthcoming book called Profiting from Conflict. We have a link in the description, so check it out. But we want to make sure that you guys actually watching this live are going to, and hi, Gladys, I see that you're waving at us. Hi, Gladys Webb. Um, you actually get some, some uh, practical tips that you can take away and make more money. You know, the reason I'm excited to have Rob on is Rob, you know, deals with all types of acquisitions, but he's dealt with major, complicated, multi-million dollar acquisitions. And negotiate, you'll learn that negotiations, baby, is just negotiations and you need to master it. And I really love the seven skill sets um, for, from every nego to win every negotiation that we're going to be talking about and that Rob developed himself. So we're going to be talking about Rob. We're going to, be, we're going to get into his skill sets. Ask your questions. You know, Marco and I are in San Antonio. Rob is in Los Angeles. Rob has worked in Seattle and Vancouver and Nevada and Colorado, and he's currently in Los Angeles. Make sure you put your um, your your market where you work in the comments below and ask your questions. Okay, so Marco and Rob, if you want to say hello, and then I have a question for the two of you uh, once you're ready. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you, Rob, for being here today. My honor, my pleasure. Okay, great. So um, Daniel, Diggy Dan Turner said, good afternoon. So good afternoon, Daniel. Remember, if you Daniel. ask your questions, this is the time to ask a question for Rob. We're going to be doing this for about 60 minutes. We're going to dig into his seven skills that he's used to uh, you know, make a lot of money and, and acquire a lot of very complicated products or, or projects in, develop, in real estate development and acquisitions. Okay, but I wanted to start with a, with a story. You guys telling a quick story about the power of negotiation. So um, maybe we could start with Marco. Uh, and it looks like Matt Smith is in Colorado, Nevada, and Nebraska. Those are his markets. How's it going, Matt? Matt's all Welcome. over the place. He's, yeah, got, he's got feelers in all the markets. That's right. Mover and shaker. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. right. I told him he needs to do deals in San Antonio. So maybe eventually he'll make his way over here. That's coming. And then LA, of course, which I bet LA is probably a pretty difficult one to break into. Um, okay. So let me ask you guys a question. And we'll, we'll start with Marco. Um, and then Rob, if you can answer the question as well. I'd like you guys to both tell a very quick story about negotiation. And I want you to think back to a time when you did not know a particular skill <laughs> or tactic that you do know today and how back then not knowing cost you money. So Marco, can you tell us a quick little story about that, about a deal? Sure, so uh, one of the main things I learned very early in my wholesaling career um, was actually in the realm of being honest and being authentic to who I was. Um, and this is kind of an annoyance with a lot of investors when they're looking at wholesalers that are getting into the business is a lot of newer wholesalers and sometimes investors will kind of project to be something that they're not. So as a common uh, phrasing or story, a lot of wholesalers will say, hey, I'm coming in, Mr. or Ms. Seller. I'm going to be the one purchasing the property. I got all these funds. I close 10 deals a month. I'm this big hotshot investor and they've never done an investment deal. And this might be their second wholesale potential transaction at all. And actually, I fell in that camp in the very early part of my career. And that was something that I was taught, that I was told to do. Hey, project as if you're um, something more than you are and try and, um, you know, try and convince the sellers to work with you based on this image that you portray. And to bring it down to a real life scenario, I've had at that time in my early career in the first few deals, I had some particular properties where I negotiated to a particular price point and um, you know, I, I was newer, still trying to learn the numbers, and the price point that I had negotiated to did not work. 
So I went back to the seller and I tried to renegotiate all in the framework of, hey, you know, I'm this big investor. I don't have my funds in line. I'm not going to be able to close, you know, due to these other investments I have, I need to get the price a little bit lower. And I wasn't able to get that property at the price point I needed. And I lost that contract, lost that deal. And the big learning lesson for me was actually a few deals after that, where I actually had a contract on a property for $18,000. I thought at the time that particular property at 18,000 was a great deal, though this property needed a significant amount of work. After talking to all of my buyers, all of my investors uh, in, in my network, in my list, I found that 18,000 for this particular property was too much. And actually I needed to have the contract at 13,000. So this time with this particular family, I just had a really good connection with them. I met the husband, the wife, they had actually inherited the house from um, the husband's mother who had passed away. And they were just, it was a problem house, had foundation problems, roof problems, everything you can think of. And they just wanted to be done with the house. And on this particular house, I tried a different approach and I tried the approach of just being authentic and real who I was and being forthright and honest with these people saying, Hey, I'm not the investor closing on this property. I'm actually wholesaling this contract. I have the contract. I have an investor who is ready to go on it, but they need the price at you know this amount. So we need to do the contract at 13,000. And I let them know what I was making on the deal. I was very forthcoming. And instead of projecting that I'm this big time investor uh, due to my novice mentality you know, prior to that, I just told them who I was. I was authentic and I was honest. And I remember that they were, they, when I asked them that, there was no, I was expecting this fight, you know, we're at 8, 18,000. I really had to push back and forth with them. But really when I asked them, it was very simple. Yes, let's do it. Let's go down to 13,000. And that was just a huge, eye-opening experience for me very early on that, you know, why was I projecting? Why was I being inauthentic? And why were, was I acting as if I was something other than who I was? So from then on, I always had the approach and the mindset of being honest, being forthright, and being um, very forthcoming with who I was as an individual, what I was planning on doing, and just being, uh, working together with them, and being overall authentic. So that was a big learning lesson for me early on. Awesome. And Rob, what about you? I, I think that's a, a great story. And uh, I would say that I like the way that the before and after question is, is framed. Like, you know, what did you look like as a negotiator before? And then what do you look like after? And, and it's been quite a few years since I, I made this sort of same mistake, but it was that to try to believe that negotiators are these sort of power brokers that, that, you know, what I've learned since then is that the you don't want to be a power broker in that sense. You're, you're not trying to portray, portray power. You're trying to give them the sense that they're powerful. And and several times I, I remember negotiating with some people that taught me a lot about it, where I would go in trying to control the situation and be the powerful guy, the proverbial red tie, if you will. And uh, you know, the one guy in particular I dealt with just kept saying to me, "Hey." I'm just a rookie, you know, whatever you think. And, and somehow at the end of the negotiation, I didn't do nearly as well as he had done. And then I ran into him years later, maybe 10 years later. Uh, and I, he's actually a friend of mine today. This is probably 25 years ago. And literally the same language. Hey, you know, I'm just a rookie. You're the one that knows what you're doing. I, I don't know, like you, you tell me. And, and uh, so I, I've learned that, you know, great negotiators don't look like great negotiators you want to be I wouldn't say humble or have humility you just don't want to try to eat up all the oxygen in the room with your power you want them to feel the sense of power and so every time I've uh, disobeyed that I've not done nearly as well makes That's sense awesome. I like it great story no it's a great story it's powerful and uh, guys if you have any questions we're about to to go into some of the um, the actual skill sets that Rob has developed that he's going to be putting in his forthcoming book, Profiting from Conflict. But Marco, did you have any, um, you know, follow up on this, those stories and the, the power of conflict with, with Rob? I, I think that's a, 
<clears throat> That's a good point, and I think the the what I've noticed is the good negotiators are the ones that are the most in tune in the conversations and in the moments, and aware of, um, you know, the different thought process and mentalities and perspectives of, of the different individuals in the room or the different individuals associated in the negotiation, and they're mindful of you know what their motivations are, what the incentives are, and really coming to coming, bringing to the table an approach that where everybody can win and, and everybody can um, meet a common goal. And I know you talk about this in as one of your key points there, Rob, I'm excited to get into it. But I, well, I think I, that's I, a, go ahead. I think that uh, basically the mistake people make when they try to influence others is, and I, I see you put up on the screen this one page where I have at my website, people can go click on it if they want to follow it. But the third skill I have is what's called use a five to one strategy. Oh, I, I wanted to ask this, you about that. Why don't we dig uh, in there? I love that one. Go well, for I it. Well, I think there's this tendency to tell people what you think. Like, I, I want to influence you, therefore <laughs> you should want to hear what I think. It's the opposite when you want to influence or negotiate with someone. You're there to hear what they think. I, I think in terms of, like, these two separate hats you would wear. One is a scientist and one's an engineer. The scientist is after facts and information. He wants to understand the terrain. You know, he wants to understand the the things that he's dealing with. And, and so you don't want to make a decision before you get to a negotiation because you're there to learn. You're there to understand and find something non-obvious that you hadn't thought of before. And you can't do that if you're talking. you got to get them to talk. So I try to roughly, you know, give out one piece of information for every five I get because it's got to feel reciprocal, like you're both giving something and taking something. But I'm there to find out what they know. So, so it's not like a like a, a an interview session where you're just grilling them with question <coughs> after question. You're also giving them some information on your own. Yeah, you're you're trying to evoke. It's not grilling at all. It's not questioning at all. You're trying to create this atmosphere where they want to talk about themselves. Or they, you see, when one of the things I really feel strongly about is that almost everything in a negotiation that's of value is hidden from view. First of all, oh, that's interesting. even, even the that. basic. That's huge. That's, yeah, that's totally good. huge. I like that. Everything that is of value in a negotiation is hidden from view. I yeah, like because that. even a basic negotiator understands the first rule of negotiation, which is never reveal your bottom line, because people are defensive naturally. They don't want to tell you what they're really thinking because they think they're going to get taken advantage of. So, you know, they might say, well, this is my position or this is my price, but you know, what's behind all that? What caused all that? What premises are they using to arrive at that position or price? And unless you want to spend serious time uh, dealing with that, they're never going to tell you. And so the second thing which precursors that is first break the ice means that, you know, you can't just get down to a logical framework with people. No one cares about your logic and they don't want to have their logic attacked or addressed at first. They're not going to give you access to the logical framework in their mind and their being until they trust you and respect you. And you've invested time sort of in their emotional framework and about who they are and what they are and what they're really after. So it sort of goes progressively like that. You have to earn your way into their logical framework to make, you know, your uh, pitch or, or your idea come true later. I think what you're saying is huge, too. And what I've also noticed, especially with a lot of the sellers that we deal with, is in a lot of cases, they haven't even taken the time to reflect and think through what they are trying to achieve. They get attached to particular numbers, particular prices. They hear the neighbor sold their house or the a property over here for a particular amount, or they just love uh, you know, the fact that it has X amount of zeros behind a certain number, and they get infatuated with a particular uh, number, and they get infatuated with that. But really, there's deeper reasons, deep, deeper deeper meanings for why they're taking this action or even they're open to being. Uh, yeah, I, I, I call it, I call it being positioned versus being principled. What you're ultimately looking for in a negotiation is principled reciprocity, a good trade of one value for another value. Whoa. Sorry, Rob, <laughs> you, you, your, your uh, audio just exploded. It like was a T nuclear bomb like, that like just T went off. T T3. So I muted you. Let me bring you back. Let's see. Right, let's see how it goes. Hi. Okay, there you go. <laughs> it was like it you'll was have like to listen to the replay. That was pretty yeah. loud. We blew somebody. Like a, yeah. No, you're fine. You're fine. We'll, we'll fix. You know, I. Is that, 
The ultimate yeah, go goal ahead. in a negotiation is principled reciprocity. Yeah. You want to trade value for value. But when people start out positional, it's, it's a defensive thing. What you're trying to do is use dialogue skills, empathy skills, listening skills to convert them from this positional attitude to a principled attitude. But you can't just call them out on it. You can't just say you're being positional. Unfortunately, it would be nice if you could, but you've got to use this sort of set of dialogue skills to get them into this. Because what, what happens is, is everybody has a premise behind what they think. Now, it might be a weak premise or a strong premise, but they're never going to disclose to you the premise until you invest time in them. So let, let's, I want to dig into some examples. So we're talking a lot of uh, important principles, um, but two things, to just so the audience knows. One, make sure you ask your questions. And two, you know, I mentioned that uh, at the beginning, but if you missed it, you know, if you just started joining us, because I know a couple of people just joined us recently, uh, you know, Rob does multifamily, but Rob, have you done single family homes ever, or do you do just multifamily and development deals? I've done the full range. I've, I've done probably, you know, honestly, maybe close to 10,000 units of single family, several thousand units of multifamily um a ton of retail commercial office buildings in the real estate realm going back to 1985 all over the place so I, i've place. had a lot of experience in everything and and so i actually talking- actually spent a period where i was a licensed broker as well for a few years so i'm able to help people understand how maybe to maybe do that job a little bit better negotiate I have listings a, i have a quick uh, two-prong question <clears throat> before sure this question since you've seen the whole wide gamut of all the different arenas in the real estate realm, <clears throat> what arena did you enjoy the most? Because I know you've also like built home, you've done development, you've done everything. And then additionally, uh, which arena did you learn the most? Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I, I really sort of cut my teeth in Vancouver, BC, doing multifamily projects in the urban core, you know, finding infill sites, tearing down old buildings to create way for new buildings. And then I went off and spent many years in the single family range. Um, And I really liked a lot of the single family acquisitions I did because I got to deal with just normal down to earth suburban people, you know, buying five acres, 10 acres or whatever. And actually, whenever I used to interview um, acquisition people for jobs, I would say to them, you know, skip your resume. Tell me how many pieces of pie you've had at a coffee table with a little old lady. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you have to be able to mirror uh, the people that you're dealing with. And so lots of people brag about how well they do in the boardroom. And, you know, and uh, I've been there too, but I, I really sort of prefer just dealing with people at their level that are common folk and trying to find, try to evoke from them a way that we can make them a better deal. I know it's corny, but I really like it when uh, they do well and we do well. And so I've really had a lot of enjoyment of that over the years. Now I'm back into doing urban stuff right now, high density urban stuff with sophisticated sellers. And it's, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're a trickier group and you've got to be much more sophisticated in how you deal with them. But, um, but the principles are the same, right? Like you're saying mm-hmm. that even if you're sitting across grandma and talking about her farm or the little acre, a couple acres of land she has or something, you know, you still, there's still hidden premises that you have to uncover just like if you're sitting across a high-powered multi, you know, lawyer who's representing this massive property in Lo- downtown Los Angeles, he has hidden premises that he doesn't want to to go into. So oh sure, and they want you to get right down to business. You know, the lawyer. I'm financially inclined. I don't want to talk about all this marketing fluff. And you know, like, and and you just sort of grin and you patient, take your time because I'm not going to disobey my way of negotiating. I'm going, I'm going to break the ice first. I'm going to make sure that I'm worthy of winning, which is a really important topic to to know. I've done my homework and negotiated internally on my side before I get there. And I'm going to dig for, you know, five to one. I'm going to try to make it his idea, et cetera. I'm going to haggle hard with him. And it doesn't matter if it's someone, you know, uh, with a lot of money or no money, it's the same skill set. And I've, I've noticed with, you know, Marco, you and other people who do this kind of acquisition, it's interesting that there is a certain similarity in terms of your, you all have this same mindset. You're all very calming people, which I find interesting. Like, you, you know, especially the more stress there is, there seems to be, you know, the more calm you get, like everyone's screaming around Marco and he's like, all right, all right. 
<laughs> I'm like, ah! You know? um, so I thought we could talk about rule number one that you have, or mindset one, and we could dig into it a little bit. I think it's an important one for people to understand, which is be worthy of winning. And I think this is the most, probably one of the more, most important ones in a sense. I mean, they're all probably equal. You could probably say that about all of them. That's what it means to have seven fundamental principles. But, you know, you put this one as number one. And I think it's it has to go first. Like you can't haggle well or have a good strategy if you're not worthy of stra of winning, right? So, I, you know, I see you guys all that are successful in this field. And I don't just mean one or two times. I mean, like you've done this for years and you're successful still, which is a whole nother thing. Um, and then once you guys, so if you could talk a little bit and dig into rule number one, how can you be worthy of winning? And how do you know if you are worthy of winning because everyone or a lot of people who have a sale or two think they're the shit, right? They think they are worthy of winning. That's not necessarily true. And being accurate with yourself and being honest is difficult. So how, you know, how do you guys think about that first rule? Well, it's, it's, it's my favorite thing. And it was the real light bulb that went into my head. I, I've been going to negotiation schools for decades now, and I've never really heard anybody say that, so I, I claim that this is a unique viewpoint that I have in terms of training negotiation. But it, you know, it's both a it's both a moral thing and a practical thing. You know, how dare you want to win unless you're worthy of winning, and 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 you can't expect to win unless you've got the skill set. So you've got to have the moral case on your side, but you've also got to have the skill set or the value on your side. You can't take lousy produce to market and expect top dollar. And so it starts with, you can't send me into a negotiation on behalf of the company unless the company's really got their uh, house in order or, or really has a good understanding of what they want. Plus, I don't want to make a deal and then come back to the company and find out I didn't have any consensus or I didn't have any sort of uh, buy-in in advance. Now I'm back to negotiating with them after the fact. So you really want to negotiate internally before you negotiate externally. So let's apply it's, this it's, to, Gl to Gladys Webb. She just asked a question. It's a very specific question. Um, so maybe you guys can help Gladys actually, um, you know, close on this deal. So I wonder if we could do this. So Gladys, if you're paying attention, I'm not going to show your question on the screen because it's a little long. It'll cover the whole screen. But, you know, I think it'll be interesting. So Gladys said, I found an apartment complex, complex and it looks like they're behind on taxes. It looks like 2016. Uh, they were at 35K and now it's at 72K. It needs work, but I have no clue how to even start. It's a $6 million unit. What do I need to do to even see if they are um, ready to sell and, you know, if I don't even have a buyer? So they have a property, they have a, a you know, Marco and, and Rob, I think you both can get into this. You know, what should Gladys do to get started? Well, I don't even, I don't even dialogue with a seller until I've done my homework. I, I, you know, in our, my realm of the, we call it underwriting. I mean, I underwrite the deal. I want to know what levers I have to pull in terms of price and terms and everything before I even speak to a seller. I used to, in the old days, sort of go to someone and say, Hey, are you for sale? And what would it take? And what price do you want? And, and I actually think that's a bit of an error. I want to know something because not that I want to tell them what I'm thinking, but I want to hear when they say something that they might want, how it fits in with what I've already underwritten. And then, huh. you know, I want to have the dialogue based on an informed set of knowledge about what I think is the case before. And so when she says in her question, I don't have a buyer, uh, you know, line up a buyer, um, underwrite it, figure out what it's worth on your own, and then get a tentative investor or a buyer in hand and then talk to the seller. Now, you're not going to necessarily tell them what you think, but you, you'll at least know where you, what you're dealing with first. So be worthy of winning in that sense Yeah. before, before you go try to break the ice and get information from them. So part of being worthy of saying... I, I lopped ahead of you there. No, that's fine. no I, I would just like... It's, oh, go ahead, Kirk. No, I was going to sum up. It just sounds like you're saying part of being worthy in this case is to gather the information... <laughs> Have a sheet of all of what you can, what you do have. Try to get more information, and then go get a buyer with that. Correct. Yeah, run a pro forma, uh, whatever whatever financial metrics and and thresholds you're using to figure out whether the deal fits. Uh, do that first. She sort of seems to be indicating here. She has I, I have no clue how to start or what it's worth, etc. But no, if if you don't know, how do you expect them to know? 
Good point. Mark, I would just expand upon that, and he, uh, Rob mentioned it already, <clears throat> is basically just finding an investor that is already investing in that type of realm of property. Uh, I forgot how many units you said, but find an investor or a group of investors <clears throat> that are already purchasing properties in that realm and talk to them about it. Hey, I have this lead. I have this information. I've already done this amount of due diligence. <clears throat> you know, What's additional information that you would need to know to be able to make a decision on this or how would you evaluate it? And the value you're bringing to that individual, that investor is a potential deal and you can do all the work and uh, you know you can bring them a deal. Now, obviously you have to, not everyone's gonna have the time or want to work with you, but uh, if you're persistent about it, there will be some people that'll see value in what you're, what you're bringing to the table. And then you're kind of working it backwards. So you're using the information from the buyer to kind of guide you in what to say to the seller. Another thing is that, that's really good stuff, Marco. All right, another thing is, is a lot of people in real estate focus on this phrase, uh, location, location, location. And, and my first mentor 30 years ago told me, to hell with that, think about timing, timing, timing. And, and you know, I think that's actually a much more important thing when you're looking at investing in real estate. So you need to get them at the right timing. And what you're trying to do is, if they're not at the right timing, you wanna lay the seeds so that you sort of put this deal in orbit and it comes back around at some point. And now you've laid a great uh, framework or foundation they'll think about you months later, wow, you know, Marco really knew what he was talking about at that point. He's the guy we want to deal with. But if you're sort of flaky and don't have your proverbial crap together, they're, they're not going to remember you well when the timing is right. Yeah. That's huge. That was good. So I kind of interrupted you, um, but I think this, I think this was relevant to being worthy of winning. I think it was a good example of you know, what you can do and Gladys, you say, okay, but if you have any other questions or follow-ups, you know, please let us know. It, it seems like for Gladys, the thing she needs to do, the number one thing to do today is start making a list of buyers and start going out and finding buyers. Is that the, like, if you were to make a checklist, would that be like number one at this point? I would uh, say yes. Go ahead, Marco. Yeah. I, I would say yes for this particular scenario, because it sounds like this deal that she's trying to go after is way out of her knowledge realm and her comfort realm. So <clears throat> she needs to leverage experience and knowledge and expertise of others to guide her on how to even approach this deal because she doesn't even know what the first step is. So if she yeah, can- Yeah, like, what are your standards? Standards, what is my framework for deciding whether a deal is good or bad? Um, do I have a best case, a worst case, and a probable? And, and a, what financial metrics am I trying to achieve or, or, or meet in order to pull the trigger? That's actually a great thing for a lot of brokers is qualifying. You know, there's two there's two important aspects to qualifying somebody when you want when you're going to work with them. Number one is, are they willing to pull the trigger? And the other half of that is basically, are they capable of pulling the trigger? And until they're in that framework, you probably don't want to deal with them. So if that's true, you need to apply or ascribe that same sort of thing to yourself. Are you able to pull the trigger and are you willing to pull the trigger? And that's part of that internal negotiation. And what, and what framework would she pull the trigger? Yeah. And does she have a buyer in tow so that she can pull the trigger? Okay. You can't be a hypocrite, right? You gotta, you gotta apply standards. You can't reserve for yourself a sort of set of standards and biases and, and, and principles that you wouldn't expect of others. I have one more uh, caveat on this one. I know this is a long tangent. Gladys, we want to give you some real value, some good insight, okay? Um, the last thing I would mention is for the, a deal like this, your mentality and your focus should be strictly on learning. A lot of people, they look at this and they're like, how much money can I make on this? I can, you know, a bigger project, I can make, you know, five figures on it and they try and beef it up. You should not be concerned with the money at all. And with, with this being so far uh, out of your normal comfort zone, just use this as a learning experience. Even if you made not one dollar on this, but you were able to work with the buyer and work with the seller and get from, hey, this is one that I just found with back taxes all the way to the closing table and the, the buyer acquired the property, that's gonna be a vastly huge learning opportunity for you that you got for free. And then you can apply the concepts that you learned from that onto the next property, the next property, because you will retain that information and it'll forever into your future help you. So don't be focused on the money, 
you focus on uh, the accomplishment of providing value to the people you're working with. Gladys asks, where do I get or learn the education? Well, go to my website and sign up and I'll teach you. But also, I invite people to to phone or email me questions at any time and I'm happy to de delve into it deep, more deeply with it. But I, your point's excellent, Marco. You learn something from every experience. You just got to get in the trenches. Yeah, so uh, Gladys, if you go to profitingfromconflict.com, I have it in the description. We also have, um, I'll put in the comments Rob's email, if that's okay with Rob. Um, and, you know, so if people want to reach out to you, they can ask you there. But you could also go to his Facebook page and message him on his Facebook page, which is also Mark. So, and, and then, of course, Marco and Hilko team are always doing negotiation training and lots of training. So there's a lot of training available um, you know, that that's out there. So go, go out there and, and, you know, get started. And I wanted to, to actually just real quick, unless you guys had something to, to do so much of rule one, just in this little synopsis, which, which is the precursor to a whole book that you're finishing up is so applicable to everything you guys just said, you know, about, and, and with, um, Gladys, you know, you win or win, win in negotiation to the extent that what you have to offer provides good value or a better way of thinking. That's exactly what Marco just said. A better way of thinking in this case, if I'm not mistaken, is thinking about not making a dime, but learning so that the next time you can make 10 times as much as you might even potentially win this time. Does that sound accurate to you guys? Yeah, but but like that's the down, that's the downside. That's the worst case. So there's, there, you know, the, the best case is she might make a lot of money uh, she might make a hell of a deal, you, but you got to get in there and try. And, uh, you know, it's it's like analysis paralysis. You're not trying to become an expert negotiator and then go negotiate. You learn to become an expert negotiator by negotiating, by failing, by having no said to you countless times, and by being rejected and refused. And, and, and that's how you hone your game. And the principles I outlined are 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 done so that you can keep referring back to them simply to see where you might have stumbled. Like, you know, where, how did I mess that up? Or, or and so I, I, you know, assert that those are a good set of skills to refer to after you've left the negotiation to see where you might have done things differently. Okay, uh, Mark, did you have anything to add? I was going to move to. No, I think let's move on. Uh, but before we move on. Uh, this, the, the seven principles here, I thought was huge. When I was uh, looking over this a little while back, I thought you had really distilled it down very succinctly and beautifully, uh, Rob. And, Thank you. Uh, I, I think this would be awesome for everybody that's watching to be able to access it. Uh, did you put the link for this in the comment section already, Kirk? Yeah, so I think if um, I'll, I'll put it again, but there's um, a PDF you can find on profiting from... Um, right at the top of the floor. page. Yeah. Right at okay, the top of the page. But I'll, I'll make sure to put all more links in the comments later as well. <laughs> but there, if you go to Profiting from Conflict, you can download it. You should also sign up for the future um, comment or the future updates on the book because the book, of course, is going to have more information on uh, you know on the book, which is going to have a lot more detail. We're kind of digging into some of the the basic stuff. By the way, we have a question from Matt Smith. Um, that I think we can talk about and may be relevant for rule number two, which is what I wanted to get into next was rule number two a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I was trying, I'd like you guys to, you know, while I'm reading this to try and think of some specific examples of breaking the ice and how, you know, there's hidden premises, like you said, and, you know, a time when you found a hidden premise that was actually blocking you from completing a deal which in talking to Marco, I think happens quite a bit in negotiations. But, but here's what Matt says. So Matt says, Matt Smith, and Matt, I'm not going to put your, um, your comment up because it's beautiful but super long, so it'll cover the whole page. <laughs> but um, so he asked, how do you negotiate with someone who won't budge? I have a lady who owns several rentals. I offered her 30 grand one year ago, and she's stuck at 40 grand. I've tried to offer her various offers, such as 40 grand with her owner financing or 30 grand in full. I think he needs cash in full. Is there any way to get her to budge? I have purchased one. I have purchased one of her rentals before. So, so it's somebody has a, a, a relationship with and he's trying to, you know, get her on this particular deal. So who wants to go first, Marco or Rob? 
I, I can jump in there. Um, so first off, the fact that you have already closed a deal with her is like huge. That's like massive in so many different ways. You've proved concept with her. So you have like one up compared to anyone else that talks to her at all. And, um, you know, when people are firm on their price points, what I try and do is rethink my approach. Maybe the approach that I've been taking or the you know, one or two approaches I've been taking is not connecting with her. And I'll try different approaches, different benefits, different explanations, and try a bunch of different ways. It sounds like you did a variation of that with the owner finance route. Maybe you can do like a hybrid where uh, the down payment's 30 grand, and then she takes a second note for 10 grand uh, rather than financing the full 40. Um, you can look for other buyers that can pay higher price points because they do different things with the investment themselves um, to make it work that way. You could do a package deal. Hey, rather than just 30 grand on this one house, why don't we do four of your houses at 30 grand a piece? So now you're moving more than just one. And sometimes people are just going to be firm. Some people are just going to be um, you know, specific to their price point, and that's where you need to be a master at, at follow-up, following up with them once a week, twice a week, once a month, whatever the appropriate timeline is based on your communication and your history with that person is going to be important because they may be firm now, but a month from now when their life circumstances change, um, you, know, you, you need to be ready and available to move forward. And the last piece of advice I would say is just really – <clears throat> and Rob was mentioning this earlier, is get down to the fundamentals. If they're saying, no, I knew we have four, 40, find out why. What is it about 40 specifically that she needs that number particularly? And it might be something that has nothing to do with money that you might be able to solve that problem with uh, for her. Uh, you know, this is very common with people like homeowners that they're like, hey, I need to pay for, you know, I have to move. I need money to co cover payer uh, movers and things like that. Well, what if I paid for all that for you? Or maybe she's thinking that she's having to pay all the closing costs. Well, what if I pay all the closing costs for you? you know, what if I pay your taxes for you? Ask her a lot of why questions. Why is it 40000 And then use that to figure out how you can provide different value, different benefits to still create a win-win. I, I think that's uh, very well said and, and good stuff. Um, what, what's, what I would infer from that um, is – excellent, which is that you're trying to, what Marco's doing there is he's using expand the pie language. You know, there, there's, there's other things. And uh, going back to the principles, you know, everything that's of value in a negotiation is hidden. So you, that just means you haven't done your work yet to get there. The other thing Marco said is, you know, find out why she's stuck on 40. I guess what's missing from the question is why are you stuck on 30? You know, that's the internal negotiation. Why are, why 30? There's, there's got to be an explanation for that or it doesn't have any validity, you know, and, and so you've got to negotiate on your side. If you're just trying to, you know, get someone to agree with you, I, I guess you can try to wordsmith and build rapport and see if they come around. But maybe it's, again, a timing issue. It just has to go into orbit for a while and you come back in a few weeks and see her and see what circumstances have changed for her. Really like more than anything the expand the pie language. You know, uh, is there something else there that we could build off of and make an even better deal that we had not thought of before? Something non-obvious. I think that I think that's really powerful. That you know, the idea of reflecting your, you know, asking yourself the difficult question. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens more often than we think. Where we, you know, are you know, we're saying, why are they not budging? It's like, wait, why are you not budging? You know, that's another Matt. I don't think I don't know if that's what you're doing. I, you know, I'm just saying I think that's a a good point of reflection. So anything else? Because we have Mr. Daniel Diggy Dan Turner with a great question. I thought uh, we could. I'd love to have one. a nickname like that. That's a cool nickname. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. He's a big fan of Marco and the Elko team. So is Matt Smith, and we love you guys. Thank you for yeah, always uh, coming Daniel, on. Daniel, actually, we, when we did our giveaway, I think it was like a month, two months ago, he was our winner. He won our negotiation course. So I hope your negotiation skills have increased and you've been able to do more deals, Daniel. There you go. And by the way, Marco, to your, to your credit, I've listened to quite a few of the videos you have there, and I thought you had some really good stuff there. So I, I – uh, I think awesome. I recommend I recommend uh, people dig into it. Appreciate it. There was a lot. You said failure. There was a lot of failures to learn some of those <laughs> yeah. things, and we're still trying to figure it out. 
Okay, so here's Daniel Diggy Dan's uh, Diggy Dan Turner's question. He asks, "What are ways to approach a seller from a reference that maybe a referral that don't want them to know they provided you with their information and still um, not come off offensive, but need a way to connect and building rapport?" So I think um, if I do, you guys, does that make sense? The question. Mm -hmm. I okay. think so. So he's so it's like asking. you get a referral, right? And then you, but that person who gave you the referral doesn't want their name. Like Rob tells me somebody uh, to talk to, but he doesn't want me to say that Rob referred him. Uh, Dan, if that's what you mean, say yes. But otherwise, uh, I think that's it. And then, you know, how do you approach this new person that you've been given the referral to without offending them? Uh, you know, because you can't talk about how you learned about their name. I think that's it. And build rapport. So I'll, I'll jump in here, uh, Rob, because I imagine uh, in your realm with these, uh, you know, numerous huge properties, you know, referrals ain't that big of a deal or connections uh, are pretty standard. Um, but in this situation, actually, Dan, uh, uh, Daniel, honestly, the whole reference point, I'll use it if, you know, I'm trying to segue in that, you know, I can leverage the rapport built of the previous person. You're mentioning that you, that person doesn't want you to refer them. The, where I got their information or how I got in contact with them is like a blip in the conversation. I just usually, we do a ton of cold calling here at Hilco Homes. So uh, we'll say, hey, we just noticed your house. We want to talk to you about it, see if you're interested in selling. And then we kind of go into the conversation. If they do reference like, hey, how did you get my number, those type of things, we'll mention, hey, we got your information from public record and we'll go into a further conversation from in, in that regard. But honestly, that's like never an issue, never really a problem. Uh, if they're interested in selling, they're going to go into, they're going to lead into our conversation. They're going to follow our lead when we're talking to them on the phone. So uh, where they got the info or where we got their info is not usually that big of a concern. And if they don't want to sell, they're going to make that apparent anyway. So um, that that's not really a big issue. I would just you know go straight into your conversation and just tell them who you are and start trying to build a rapport and, and, and finding out if they want to sell and let them know what you can do and go into the conversation. Yeah, it's uh, part of the world of, of buying property is, is cold calling on the phone or in person. One of my... Uh, axioms or primary um, laws or rules that I follow is that no matter what, even if you have to cross the earth to do it, negotiate face to face or in person. Uh, if you really want to build that rapport, you're going to do a much better job of it by knocking on their door than phoning or emailing them. Um, Likeability is a huge factor in negotiation. And you got to go in there with a smile and try to introduce yourself and just tell them what your goal is. I'm looking for property in the neighborhood. Uh, and maybe not even ask them if theirs is for sale. Just say, uh, do you know what might be for sale in the neighborhood? And maybe they'll tell you theirs is, or maybe they'll tell you something else is. So maybe not be so um, focused on trying to nail them down, but just sort of try to create or establish this framework where they're an ally for you in the neighborhood. And uh, that, that's a little bit more indirect. Before you're direct with people, you like to try to be indirect with them first so that you build rapport. But face to face, that's the only way to do it. That, that's huge. Um, a lot of people, when they're starting out, they try and do what's easy. So they'll maybe do more like text messaging, those type of things. But when it comes to negotiation, the closest you can get to face to face is best because then you you're not just a voice, you're not just a name, you're an actual person, human being in front of them, and they can't run from you if you're having a conversation. Whereas if they're on the phone, they can hang up. If you're texting, they can ignore your texts. Um, so whenever you have the opportunity to be in front of them, um, especially in the negotiation conversation, when you're doing your walkthroughs, bring a contract with you, try and do it all in person, you're going to have a higher success rate in that realm, for sure. I, I had a situation just this week where I'm dealing with a seller, and I'm in L.A., and he was in Pebble Beach, and I said, yeah, I, I would really like to, to sit down and meet with you. And I didn't know he was in Pebble Beach, and he said, well, you can't because I'm all the way up in Pebble Beach. I said, Kind of looked at my phone. I said, I think I can be there in about three and a half hours. And I, you could tell I was dead serious about it. And I didn't end up going, but but he really appreciated that I was willing to go that length, like right now to go meet with him because it, it was important and it's a lot of money at stake. Can you tell us a little bit about that deal? Because I think there is, because we, we've kind of been under the presumption 
um, like the audience that the deals are, you know, negotiation is negotiation, but you are dealing with slightly different realm. So for instance, um, in different Hester, stratosphere, it's different stratosphere. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah. well, but here's, here's the thing is like what Marco and the Hilco team talk a lot about is they actually, I think would argue not to do that until a certain point because of the nature of the, their deals. Is that correct, Marco? So with us, we do a lot of cold calling and we do a lot of volume. And so what I try and do is be most time efficient. Um, and so we don't really go to properties unless they meet certain thresholds. We're close on numbers, those type of things. However, when they've been identified as a potential, we're close on numbers or they're serious and they know we're serious, then we'll do whatever we got to do to make it happen and actually go in in person is a way to separate yourself from everybody else that's talking to them and again uh, personify you in their mind yeah so I think the the and, and Rob here you can go I was just I think the the difference is just like the the where that threshold probably is like I would imagine and correct me if I'm wrong Rob but and may, I, I like to hear a little bit about the deal if you could talk about it maybe you can't um, but you know like the threshold might be a little bit different when you're talking a multi-million dollar deal versus a, you know, fifty thousand dollar wholesale deal, right? Um, is that does that make sense? Am I am I on the right track at all? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I quite understand, but I think what I would say about that is I I, I don't want to go to a meeting, whether it's a high level or a low level, until I know what I'm talking about. So I do want to do analysis and, and my underwriting and my you know understanding the framework before I do that. In this particular case we're well beyond that and we're, you know, have a signed letter of intent and we're trying to renegotiate something uh, that was misunderstood. And so the framework is there that why would I do that in a haphazard way or a, a simple way? Cause I really need that face to face time to ask him the right kind of questions, you know, to get him to negotiate against himself, to, to make this new thing that I want to do instead of my idea, I want to make it his idea. And I can't do that very effectively by email or phone. So I'm willing to cross the world or I want to cross the world to get in front of them. And I don't think it matters if it's, uh, you know, something in the tens of millions like this is, or if it's a hundred thousand dollars, it's the same sort of thing. People respond well to likability and, and, and it's almost like, when you're in the room, they can't escape. Like there's nowhere to go. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no clicking. Don't take that too seriously, phone. everybody. All right, be careful. All right, you can't yeah, lock. The door. Thank you. You can't just to cover our legal bases. You can't find a <laughs> a person and and lock the doors and like you can't get out of here. Everybody, it's like no. You can only leave by signing. The I think some yeah. people are some, some people have tried that with me. Correctly, but no. So it's it's like they give you an offer you can't refuse. No, no, no. Well, no, it, sh no. it shows tremendous sincerity, tremendous interest in what they have to say, you know, and and I think it's just worth it so much. But but I agree, you don't want to go meet with people till you really know what you have something, some really keen understanding or knowledge of what you think it's worth or, or what you think you want to do. Otherwise, you're just wasting time. And if you go to a meeting and waste someone's time, they'll never want to talk to you again. So, yeah, you're just there to sort of yank their chain. They don't. They don't want to invite you back. Kirk, yeah. you were mentioning like what is the threshold? I think the threshold, which applies to really any deal of whatever size, is are we in the same ballpark? And you need to know what the ballpark is based on your own uh, reflections and calculations and assessment of the deal. Which Rob was mentioning, you you've done your own analysis, so you know what the ballpark is. And are they in that ballpark as a serious? Person. Are they seriously considering what you're talking about? Are we having serious conversations? If we're in the same Paul Park and you're serious, then I'm willing to meet with you. I'm willing to, you know, do whatever it takes so we can come to an agreement. So let me let me ask you this though. Like, you know, Marco, now I imagine, and same thing with Rob, what is in your ballpark might actually be more small than at the beginning. So what I mean by that is you may, is this true in the beginning? you may be willing to take extra chance, and maybe you should take extra chances that you normally wouldn't today, you know, in terms of wasting your time today versus then, because you just need to get your first couple of deals going or something like that. Does that make sense? So yeah, does that make sense? Right, so for my team in the typical deal realm that we deal in, and we, you know, our type of property is very common, uh, I want, I want the seller and where we're at to be within 
$10,000 or $15,000 at kind of the most. When we get into higher price points and we kind of talk about it, that's where you need to know your numbers. Uh, and I'll talk to my team member and we'll do some calculations, those types of things, and depending on the property itself. But we deal with mostly properties that are valued $140,000 and less. So that's kind of been our general rule of thumb. But that's something that you learn as you do more. And uh, you know, those ratios obviously adjust appropriately to the property. Well, I, I would also say that there's, um, it seems to be this, it's not an exact rule, but there's obviously the, the more value a property has, it's likely that there's more self-esteem in the ownership that you're dealing with. Or, or a more sense of their own worth or understanding of what they're worth. Um, people in the lower market may not have confidence in what they're worth. People that are much higher up have much have tremendous confidence, probably usually because they've been given advice. So you're, you're, you have to sort of, uh, the higher you go up in price, the more knowledge you really have to have about what you're talking about, I would think. Makes sense. Um, so Matt has a follow-up question. Do you guys have any advice with negotiating uh, a junior loan down? I would love to get into investing and discounting junior loans, but negotiating with a bank sounds scary. Do you guys have experience well, with that? Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, negotiation with banks over the years, um, cram downs, all kinds of different things for some big numbers, especially back in the crash in 07, 08, there was a lot of uh, renegotiating of loans going on. I, I spent about two <laughs> years doing that. Um, but wow. basically speaking, those are usually leverage plays where you're just trying to leverage them into, into a certain way of thinking. But there's nothing more powerful in the world of real estate than this one word, option. <laughs> an option is, is the ultimate goal in negotiation, that you want an option to do something. Because then you can sort of pull the trigger when all circumstances are optimal. So the way to, to work that deal is get it under contract with an option that if you're able to get the bank to negotiate, you'll pull the trigger. And if not, you walk away with as little skin in the game as possible. Okay. Marco? I don't really have experience in negotiating junior loans, but the whole option component, I definitely agree with. You know, um, you know, options are huge. People use it in wholesaling all the time. And additionally, the special provisions realm you can draft up all kinds of different conditions that give you uh, leverage points and outs as needed on particular deals. So that's where you just need to be creative and, and uh, figure out yeah, how and to I, make I, a win-win. And by option, I, I don't necessarily mean literally an option, but the option, the contingency to do what, you know, to make something happen before you have to actually commit heartily to it. But basically, junior loan people, it depends on the equity in the property and depends on what you might know about their willingness to, you know, foreclose up or, or hang in there, but it's usually just a leverage play, whatever leverage you can apply against them. Um, and that's something you have to think about in terms of, you know, whether you think that that's what you want to do for a living. That's not something I'm too interested in because I don't want to frankly go around leveraging people. You know, I, I prefer influence. I prefer the art of influence rather than the art of leverage. What do you think is the difference? That's an interesting force. Force. Okay, so the difference between influence and leverage is force. Can you expand on that? That's so influencing is well. Yeah, can you differentiate a little bit more with some maybe details or examples? Well, there's this. I mean, one extreme is you force someone to do something. The other one is is that you you talk them into it. Um, and in between, there is a lot of gray area <laughs> about you know, are you manipulating them? Because you you okay. know, I, I just don't want to spend any time personally manipulating people and I don't work for people that manipulate. So I don't want to spend much time um, being a Svengali or, or, you know, uh, conning someone's mind or, or leveraging them and taking advantage of a bad situation they're in. That doesn't mean I don't want to pay the lowest price. I'm just not going to sort of um, set up this sort of web of leverage in my life. Um, so I, having said that, you need to become an expert in leverage so you can defend yourself against it. Mm. But most times when you're yeah. dealing with a bank, you're not dealing with a rational entity, some person that's going, hmm, that's a great idea we should do. So you're just sort of trying to pull a lever. And um, yeah. don't go looking for logic and reason where it doesn't exist. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. 
Okay, so that's interesting though. So influence is more like the psychology of another person and persuading them, you know, to be convinced on their own, right? Internally, versus leverage is you're saying something like manipulation or even physical force. It's well, like a, a man, cheating. There, how does the old saying go? And I don't remember it. it maybe it came from Samuel Butler or one of these English poets or something, but it's a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to just convince. I want him against his will. I want. That's why I say in my skills, make it their idea. Have them negotiate against themselves. Uh, and I think any top negotiator wants to spend the time and the effort to do that. That At the end, I want them to repeat business with me, speak highly of me, and feel great about the deal. And the only way they're going to do that, if you want control, you have to relinquish control. It seems paradoxical, but it's true. You mm -hmm. have to let them, you have to sort of create a vacuum uh, of which they can fill with their ideas. And as soon as they hit on the right idea, you seize on the opportunity and close it. I don't mm -hmm. want to just you know, push them around and to, to what I want to think. I want to listen and find something that they want to do and, and, and seize upon that. All right. Um, Mark, so we have a question from Hernando. Hey, Hernando, thank you for the question. He asks, can you explain a mezzanine low, loan? Pros and cons on that product. Do you guys know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I mean it's just it's just one of the layers in a in a capital stack of financing. You know that you can have a you can have a mortgage, you can have equity, and you can have a loan uh, in between there. Um, you can probably just Google, uh, you know, what it is to get a much more concise answer. But the pros and cons of it are whether or not it it makes the underwriting better. Is it accretive to what you're underwriting, or or does it debilitate it? Okay. Cool. It, it, so, I, 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 I want to know what the money is. Like, what are the facts? Money doesn't lie. You know, Pe numbers don't lie. People lie. So just look at the numbers. That's a good point. Run, run the run the pro forma with it and without it, or with a third or fourth option, um, and see, and then just compare the numbers. So it's contextual. Yeah. Well, every deal has qualitative and quantitative components to it. But when you're talking about will a loan particular loan to be a pro uh, accretive to what I'm doing. You just have to run the numbers and see it's usually not a qualitative matter. It's usually just a quantitative matter. Okay. So I think we have a couple, a couple last minutes, about five more minutes. Um, so I thought we would close with a favorite deal and it doesn't have to be a big deal, but it has to be one that's memorable to you. So is there, and then if you, the more detail, the better, and I think it'd be great for people. And if it's relevant to negotiation, great. Um, if you don't have one, that's okay. We can you know, just close up. But I thought it'd be cool to um, you know, give people concrete specifics about the deals that you guys work in on a regular basis. A lot of the people who watch the show, many of them have done one or two or three deals. Some of them are regular wholesales. But a lot of them are people who've never done a wholesale deal or any real estate deal, but they want to. Um, <clears throat> And Matt Smith. I have a fantastic one. I, I, yeah. I went to a negotiation school in about for three days in probably 89 or 90. And uh, I just gotten back and I went into a golf tournament and I won a chainsaw. And the chainsaw yeah. was worth about $400, but I had no need on this earth for a chainsaw. So I stuck it in the newspaper. Uh, the young people today don't know what a newspaper is, but anyway, you just, you just put ads <laughs> in the newspaper. Craigslist. It's the equivalent and of Craigslist. I, you know, fresh off of a negotiation course and I'm like uh, $400 firm don't even bother calling me and let, like don't try to negotiate I'm, you know put all the defensive words in there about it. I will not sell this for less than $400 and the guy calls me yeah I'll take it I said you saw the part about the $400 right oh yeah absolutely I'll be there in 30 minutes and the guy shows up in front of my house in a van that's you know oozing oil and smoke and making loud knocking and banging noises and he comes up to my door and he's in overalls and grease and he's sweating and oh I'm so glad you saved this for me and he starts pulling money out of his pockets like out of every pocket on it on his body and coins and crumpled up ones and fives and he starts counting it out in my hand and I, and I don't remember the exact number I was like 327.58 and then he pulled five dollars back and he said oh I, I need five bucks in gas to get home <laughs> and I just looked at him <laughs> and he said, dude, that's all I got. And that's a fantastic negotiation tactic, actually. That's all I got. But it was, 
<laughs> and I just grinned at him like from ear to ear, and I was like, "Son of a bitch, you got me!" And, and <laughs> so I was so amused by the whole thing. I said, "It's yours." That was beautiful. <laughs> just to get him off my front lawn, you know. That's, That's awesome. awesome. I love That's that. Story. Yeah, Marka, how about you? Uh, oh, by the way, um, just a couple things before, and Marka, you can finish up. Um, but Gladys says, so I just go to the link to get set up with Rob, correct? So you're going to get an email from Gladys Webb, uh, Rob. Is that okay? Go sure. to profiting. Profiting, profiting from conflict .com. Um, You can email me, robflitton at gmail.com anytime you want. And that's F L I T T O N. You have his yep. name up here, uh, robflitton at gmail.com. Um, yeah, and my and main website is robflitton.com, which I can be reached there as well. Cool. And Marco, before you tell your story, do you want to answer Matt Smith has a quick question? Um, sure. And I think it's maybe it may even tie into what you're going to say. But he says, can you guys explain your um, explain your most difficult negotiation? Sounds like that chainsaw might be <laughs> one of your more difficult ones. That's a challenging one, it seems like. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, Marco, do you want to talk about that or do you just want to close up with your favorite one, which you were going to talk about. It's your choice. Honestly, I can't think of particular scenarios for either one. Um, but I think some of the more difficult ones are the, kind of the scenario you explained earlier, Matt, where they're just, you know, firm and you can't really throw everything at them. You can't get them down. I mean, that's just what I've learned over time is sometimes that just not all deals are going to work. And no matter what you do, what you've tried, all the different, you know, components, I think um, where I have chosen to be proficient and to shine in scenarios like that is just be a master of follow-up so that whenever they do change and their firm position timing, um, timing, sh timing shifts. Yeah, exactly. I'm ready. Whereas everybody else who got hit with the same thing, the same firmness, all the other people trying to buy that house or property, <clears throat> they gave up and you know didn't follow up. And so then I can win. I've had follow-up that's worked two years later. Uh, which is kind of crazy. So follow up yeah. is where where right. it needs to be important. Orbit, put it in orbit, let it come back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's where you want to leverage technology systems. We leverage the CRM to just every lead has a follow up date, and it doesn't matter. We don't have to remember it. We just log in every single day, and we know who we need to touch. Uh, I guess a deal actually won this year um, that was really great for us was that we had. A property that was worth probably 265, maybe 280 uh, on the very high end. Um, if it was truly decked out, you know, uh, and uh, right down the curtails of this this market. Um, we were in touch with the owner. Uh, we had the owner uh, finance the entire deal at 185,000, where we didn't have to put any down payment on it whatsoever. So we basically bought the deal, no money out of pocket. And we were planning on putting about thirty to thirty-five thousand in rehab to it to be able to sell it at the price points I mentioned previously. And um, while we were going through the phase of bringing in contractors and assessing it, we put the property on the market as is at a slight discount because it wasn't in really bad shape. We put it on the market for two forty-five. We said, "Hey, we'll at least market it, gauge some interest while we're you know, two birds one stone while we're uh, taking contractors out there and assessing it." We got a contract within 24 hours. So we basically did a, about a 45 day flip without doing any rehab, without any money out of pocket, and we made about 30 grand on it. So that was a pretty good deal for us. Nice. I think that's a good way to end. Any final thoughts before we go? Thank you. I really enjoyed this, and uh, I would uh, encourage people to study negotiation because I think it's not just for business and buying and selling real estate, but it's an amazingly good tool to have in your personal life, getting along with and, and having better family relationships and friendships and, and uh, everything, learning how to influence people in a constructive way. I, I just second that. I really appreciate everybody watching. Negotiation is something it's beyond trying to win it's really just how you connect with other individuals to create um, agreements that everybody's happy with. And I'm learning this even more so with our two-year-old daughter. It seems like every moment <laughs> I'm negotiating with her on something. Um, so, you know. And she's winning. Take, she, is, she is destroying me. She is doing that chainsaw <laughs> thing over and over again. Um, 
But you know, this is a great it's opportunity for you to uh -huh. go into that subject. You can really learn and it. It'll give you vast returns in your business and what you're trying to achieve for your own goals. I love it. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Make sure to go to profitingfromconflict.com. Check it out. It's in the description. We also, you know, follow us at Hilco Homes. You know, we have negotiation and we have a great lead generation course coming up. So, you know, ask us any questions. Very soon. That. Very soon. It'll be coming up, I think, in the next week or two. So we spent there's about 60 videos in that. So we have a lot of great courses coming. So stay tuned. And Rob, Marco, thank you guys. And thank you all the people who, uh, you know, listen. And if you miss this live, ask your questions and we'll come, you know, back later and we will comment one-on-one -on -one and help you guys through whatever situations you're dealing with. There was a question here about recommended books or conferences on negotiation. So later on, I'll put that in the feed, what I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we'll put, we'll all put our, we should all put our favorite books in there. Um, and then I can't put profiting from conflict cause it's not out yet. I haven't read it. So you'll have to send me an early copy so I can, I can recommend that one. Count um, on it. Yeah. I'm excited. Okay. So thank you everybody. And we will see you next time. Cheers. Bye. Maybe.